In just a few moments from now, we're going to read a passage of Scripture that's going to launch us into uh, today's teaching. But before we get into, into my, my sermon that I prepared, what I want to do is I just want to share a little bit, uh, kind of from my heart, uh, in response to a bunch of questions that have been coming in uh, about what's going on right now in uh, Israel and with Palestine and all that stuff. O over the last week, uh, numerous questions and concerns have come in. Um, probably there's two questions that uh, have just risen to the top. Uh, there's, there's kind of two questions that we're hearing more of, and uh, I want to try to answer both of those. Uh, the, the, the first one is just, is there something that we can do? Like, is there, is there some way that we can practically help? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the first thing you can do is you can pray. And that is a very real thing. Sometimes we think prayer is just this nice, quaint, religious thing. No, like, man, prayer brings heaven to earth, okay? And so uh, you, you, you want to know how to help? Pray. Uh, in the Psalms, it, it, it calls us to actually pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, and what's happening right now with all the death, day by day, hour by hour, um, it is right and it is proper for the church to rise up and pray for the end of this war, uh, that we pray for the end of this bloodshed, uh, that is happening in just such gruesome ways. And um, like we've, we've all probably seen the news and the stories and like right now is a time we just, we just pray that this would end. Um, that's the first thing, we can pray. The, the second thing that you can do is you can give. Uh, we have two different organizations that we've partnered with over the years uh, in Israel. One is called Bridges for Peace. One is King of Kings Assembly. I've actually been in contact with the leaders of these organizations in the last little bit. Uh, and it's just a safe way. Both are doing amazing work. Just It's humanitarian aid and care right now. Uh, and if you want to give just very practical ways, you can do that uh, by either, if you just have an envelope in the seat in front of you, you can just write Israel on there, or you can go on our website. There's a drop-down bar. It's, 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 it's pretty simple. But uh, that's practical. Pray. And if you want to give, like over and above your regular giving to this church, you can give towards that. It's safe and secure. We're not going to keep a single cent of that. We're just going to send that off. So that's the first question. The second question is a little bit more loaded. <laughs> and it's, is this the beginning of the end? Um, like, like, is what's happening right now, um, is this biblical prophecy taking place in our midst as we speak. And you ready for my answer? Definitely, maybe. <laughs> Be blessed, I'm done speaking now. No, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, the, the, the truth is, I, I understand the concern. I understand we're watching this, it's a horrific situation. Um, but the reality is every time that there's a conflict or war in and around Israel, uh, people start quoting certain passages of scripture and they declare, this is happening now. And at some point, it's going to. But many people have claimed it and been wrong in the past. And so a as we move through this, um, I don't know what this is, if I'm just honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's not good. Uh, it has the a potential moving forward to be really, really bad uh, if neighboring countries do get involved in stuff like that. But here's what I know, okay? Here's what I know. Is Jesus returning like this week? I don't know. But here's what I do know. <laughs> Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. No one. Uh, he did, however, tell us to assess the seasons and to understand. Go, go read Matthew 24. Like he does a big, lengthy teaching on, listen, there's some things you need to be watching out for. And very much, you could argue that what's happening, what Jesus said, is, is taking place right now. Um, it's real. And like the, the, the prophecies right, from the Old Testament and Ezekiel, like is that, is that this? Maybe. Maybe not. Here's what I want to encourage you in. Jesus. None of this took, took Jesus off guard, Okay. Jesus is still on his throne. Jesus is still in control. Jesus is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and our hope is in him. 
not in any conflict or war situation on this earth. Our hope is in Jesus. And I I guarantee you, I know this for a fact, that what he wants out of his church right now is not that we would live in emergency mode, but rather we would live with urgency. Very different things. Emergency is panic, panic, panic. What are we going to do? Run to the basement, right? That's, That's panic, okay? That's, that, 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 that's emergency. Urgency, on the other hand, says, I don't know when Jesus is going to return. It might be before Pastor Danny ends this message. And what I want to do is I want to live every single moment like it might be my last. And I want to share Jesus with my neighbors and reach the lost and, and give to the poor. I, I, I want to take my faith seriously now. That's the way of Jesus. That's the way of Jesus. Not hunkering down, okay? In fact, what Jesus taught is when you see these things happening, he doesn't say, so freak out and run. No, he says, lift your head to the sky for your redemption draws near. Listen, if Jesus is gonna come back today, hallelujah, praise God. (laughs) This is exciting. He's going to put an end to everything wrong, and he's going to make it right. Heaven and earth will collide. Like, we have so many great reasons to be uh, excited for the return of Jesus Christ. So church, don't shrink back. Don't go into emergency mode. Live with urgency. You with me? Okay. Let me just say a a couple other comments, and then I'm eventually going to preach my prepared notes. (laughs) Um. As your pastor, I just want to caution you in a a couple different areas as we kind of move through this next season, not knowing where it's going to go and how it's going to develop. Uh, First thing I I would just warn you about is um, I caution you around your social media intake. Okay? You you need to use, like, discernment. There's a lot of misinformation, disinformation out there. Like, if you found over this last week of your life that you just, you're living with like a low-grade anxiety all the time, I'm gonna help you, okay? Turn off the news and shut off your phone and pray to God. <laughs> Listen to some worship, go for a walk, do something. If, if you are taking in the messaging of the world right now more than you're taking in the messaging of God, Okay? You will inevitably go down some fear-driven route. So just be careful. Be careful. Guard yourself that way. And, and then the other thing I, I just want to share, and, and this might not be like for everybody in the room, but I guarantee it's for some people here. Watch out for how fast hatred and racism can creep, can creep into a situation like this. Guard yourself. That is not the way of Jesus. The Bible teaches very clearly, for God so loved the world, the big, bad, scary world, all of it, that he gave his son Jesus, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved Israel, For God so loved Palestine. For God so loved Hamas. For God so loved the world, the big, bad, scary world that he gave Jesus. Hatred towards other people groups, racism, ethnocentrism, whatever. This is not the way of Christ. Watch yourself in the next little bit that you don't get pulled, whether it's by news outlets, Facebook feeds, Instagram posts, don't get pulled. Fill yourself with the words of Jesus. Let the word of God speak into you more than anything else right now. Keep your eyes on him. Or in the words of Jesus himself, lift up your head to the sky for your redemption draws near. Amen? Let's pray, and then we can get into my message. So, Lord, right now, 
God, we have reason to be concerned, but we do not have reason to fear. So, Lord God, I just pray over this church right now. Lord God, I, I pray that you would hold us close to your side. I pray that we would not wander. I pray that we would not uh, become something else. I, I pray against um, hatred in our hearts or racist thoughts or anything like that. God, Lord, I pray against emergency mode, but rather that we would live with urgency in these days. God, I pray for a, a restoration of mission to the church that we would not hunker down, but God, we would live with mission and purpose and vision. God, lead us in the days ahead. And Lord, your word does call us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And God, this massive war right now, that we're just, it's playing out in real time. Lord, we pray your peace. We pray for the end of death. God, we, we pray for the return of hostages. Lord, we, we, we pray that you would move that God sovereignly, you would, you would do a miracle right now, Lord, where there just doesn't really seem to be a way out of this without it getting worse. God, we know that you can intervene, and Lord, we're just praying for your peace right now. And we ask all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay, ready for sermon number two? <laughs> Let's go. Uh, Luke 12. I told you to go there. I, I want to read a passage of scripture. And uh, it's going to kind of set up everything that we're about to move into here. Uh, today, believe it or not, I'm going to be reading out of the message. I don't remember the last time I preached out of the message. Uh, but there are certain words and fr uh, phrasing here that I really liked. If you're not a fan of the message, read along with whatever translation you have. You can interpret on the spot from there. But this is where we're going to be. Luke 12, go to, with me into verse 13. So someone out of the crowd said, Teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. He replied, this is Jesus, Mr., what makes you think that any of this is my business to be a judge or a mediator for you? Speaking to the people, he went on, take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. So he talked to himself, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in all my grain and goods and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then God showed up and said, fool, tonight you die. In your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. And then if you skip down, that's the story, and you skip down to verse 33, Jesus gives some concluding comments. He says, so be generous. Give to the poor. Get yourself a bank that can't go bankrupt, a bank in heaven far from bank robbers, safe from embezzlers, a bank that you can bank on. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being. This is God's word this morning. As we continue on in this teaching series called Build This House, uh, I want to talk to us today from the, the subject of building a house of generosity. Building a house of generosity. And I know, right now, somebody's panicking. Right now, somebody's thinking, like you're breaking out into a little sweat. You're like, Danny, I invited my neighbor of all, you pick today to talk about money. Like, why do we even have to talk about money? Well, let, let me try to tell you why. Because the Bible talks a lot about our money. A lot. Like, like did you know there's over 2,000 Bible verses that actually reference our money? Did you know that Jesus speaks about our money more than he does heaven and hell combined? <laughs> you say, okay, well, why? Because, hear it, 
Money is usually the most accurate indicator of where your heart is. There's other indicators, but there's something about this that just gets to this, <laughs> right? I found this quote. Uh, I don't know who said it. Somebody much smarter than me. But I loved it. It just says this. Money is either a tool in the hand of the generous or a god in the heart of the greedy. We're just going to let that fall. Money is either a tool in the hand of the generous or a god in the heart of the greedy. Right now, your money is either a tool in your hand or a God in your heart. It just is. It doesn't matter whether you're on a fixed income, you make 100,000 a year or 5 million a year. Doesn't matter. How you view those funds determines whether it's a tool or a God. So today, yeah, we're going to be talking about money. Today, I'm talking about your dollar dollar bills, y'all. We're going to go there. But I want you to know that as we do, I, I'm not trying to, like, beat anybody up. In fact, it's the exact opposite. I'm trying to, like, set people free in the house. Uh, like, th this is very important stuff. Like, you should know, and I've said this multiple times, as the pastor of this church, I don't know who gives what at all. Uh, I sit down with Al DeSimon right there. He's my finance guy. And I see... Uh, Excel chart. I, 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 I see numbers and lines. I do not see names. So right now, as I preach, and if my eyes glance by you, and you're like, he's looking at me. Uh, I don't know who you are. You might be very rich and give nothing, and you might be very poor and sacrifice greatly. I have no clue at all. So as we go through this, uh, what I want to do, I just believe that, that God has a word for all of us today out of what we just read in Luke 12, and I just believe he's going to set people free. You ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's really only today two things that I want to talk to you about, kind of like two big ideas that I want to pull out of Luke chapter 12, and here's the first one. God owns everything you have. Like, you, we don't actually own anything. Um, and I know that for some of you, that's like a really big pill to swallow right out of the gate. Uh, but I, I promise you it's true. And I also promise you that if you don't figure this one point out, you will always struggle with being a generous person. Like, it will always be the Mount Everest for you because you view all your stuff as your own. And you did it, and you got there, and it was because of how smart you are. But the reality is, it's very clear, God actually owns every single thing that we have. Right, go back with me to the story of the greedy rich man in the barn full of grain, right? He's, he's rich, so he's, he's already doing well, and, and then he has this terrific crop, right? Yielded a, a massive amount of grain, so he fills his barn, right? And then he thinks to himself, the grain's still coming in. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So instead of taking that excess grain and giving it to needy people and investing it to expand the kingdom of God, he says, I know what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barn and I'm just going to build bigger ones for myself. Right? This is where he's at. Let's read this again. Uh, verse 19 he then says, then I'll gather all my grain and goods and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Love this. Just then, God showed up and said, you dummy. That's, that's the Danny Gray version. The truth is, the Bible, it's not much different, right? God shows up and says, you fool. Tonight, you die. And your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. Parker, God owns everything you have, including the air in your lungs. Everything. Now, to be clear in this story, Jesus' point is not, if you're greedy, I'm going to come kill you. Okay? That's not what's happening here. But he is saying is none of you know when you're going to die. None of you. 
And if you go on your entire life just building bigger barns so that everything terminates on yourself, you will go through your entire life having wasted it. It's a strong message. It's a very, very strong message. The problem with the rich barn guy was not that he was rich. It was that he lost sight of where his riches came from. It, it was he, he, he lost sight of, of the one who was giving him everything. And it's amazing when you lose sight of God how quick you become greedy and prideful. It's amazing. You know, I have um, two kids. You probably see them running around like just terrorizing this building. Um, I'm working with them. I'm working with them. <laughs> Four and six years old. And I wish we were out of this season uh, that we're particularly in, but we're in that season right now where um, we're trying to teach our kids to share. We're trying to teach them to be generous with one another. And every now and then, they do not listen to me, believe it or not. (laughs) And they'll use these two words that send shivers up my spine. Parents, you'll know exactly what they are. It's mine. Anyone? It's like a bunch of people. It's like post-traumatic stress disorder. It just fell upon. Like, it's mine. It's my shoes. It's my toys. It's, it's my game. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And so, so we're just in this season of like, like, no, let's share. Let's be generous, right? And this is a season that all parents have to go through at a certain point. What's wild to me is how many adults have grown up and somewhere along the line, we, we learned that it's socially unacceptable to say the words, it's mine, but our hearts are still there. Oh, it just got real quiet in here. <laughs> like it's happening right now. In this room. Pastor, don't come after my money. It's mine. Don't come after my stuff, my time, my talents, my treasure. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I'm telling you, it's not. Everything you have is a gift from God. That's what uh, Paul says to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4. He asked the question, what do you have that you did not first receive? Park would think about that. What do you have right now that you did not first receive? The car, the house, the finance, the family. God, 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 God. Everything we have is a gift from God. And he, and he gives it to us, right? Like he's a gracious God, he gives us exactly what we need and sometimes even more than what we need. And then we have to ask the question, well, why? If it's true that God owns everything and then he graciously gives to us, why does he give to us? Well, this brings me into my second point. And it's this, that God blesses us so we can bless others. Listen, um, I know for like a lot of us in this room, what I'm saying right now, you've heard before. And for some of you, you've like already like checked out. You're like, ah, I heard this one. Let me tell you, Samuel Johnson was the one who said that sometimes we need to be reminded more than we're taught. So if this is new for you, then be taught. If this is a reminder, this is the word that I feel strongly God wants to give to us right now. We are blessed for the purpose of blessing other people. You're not just blessed for bigger barns. You're not just blessed for more stuff. No, you're blessed to be a blessing. The rich barn guy, I mean, he completely missed this, right? Not only did he miss the fact that it was God that was giving him all this stuff, but not only that, he thought it was for him. Like, somehow he got there. Self, you've done really well. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'm going to hoard it all for myself. You have been blessed. Not just so that you can sit back and build bigger barns. You've been blessed so that you can bless other people. Uh, Go back with me. Luke 12, uh, 34. After Jesus tells the story, right? 
So it's like the guy's like, hey, I'm going to build bigger barns. And God's like, no, you're dead. And then Jesus talks and he gives the point. Verse 33 says, so be generous. Give to the poor. And then this is actually why I chose the message. I just like in this section how it broke down this thought. It's like, get yourself a bank that can't go bankrupt. A bank in heaven, far from bank robbers, safe from embezzlers, a bank that you can bank on. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Jesus here just lays it down and gives this picture. There's two different things that you can invest in in this world. You can invest in the bank of this world or you can invest into the bank of God. There are earthly things that you can invest in, give all of your time and your energy and your finance, and we can go down that road. The problem with the world is people can break in and steal. People can rob that. It doesn't actually do what we think it's doing. The beauty of banking with God, (laughs) the beauty of investing into the kingdom of God in his work on this earth now is that that investment is safe for all of eternity. Nobody can ever take that away. And so Jesus just breaks it down. He says, well, like wherever you invest, that's what you're going to become. If you want to invest into the things of this world, you're going to be worldly. If you spend all of your time and energy investing into yourself, you're going to be selfish. But if we invest into God's kingdom, if we take this life that we have right now and we say, God, this is not about me and any blessing that I have is a gift from you so that I can go out and bless others when you do that. When you go there, you're investing into something that can never perish, ever. It, like, it is a safe investment for the, for the rest of your existence. But it begs the question, if this is true, what Jesus is saying here, and there's several passages where he reiterates the exact same point. If it's true, then why don't we do it more? If it's true (laughs) that when we invest into kingdom efforts, we are like, we're like putting stock into something that, that, that will always come back with an amazing return. If it's true, then why do so many either give nothing or just it's very sparse? Why is there a wall that we hit with this conversation. Just over, why, for maybe many in the room today, why are you able to follow Jesus in so many parts of your life, but when you get to this one, (laughs) it's like there's just something there. Why? I think I have an answer. There's probably many reasons, but I'm gonna give you a big one. Ready? Because the devil is a liar and a tempter. Every single day, <laughs> we hear a different message. Every single day, there's like that, that ancient serpent of old speaks. And we hear this messaging that says, well, yeah, you have a lot of stuff, but if you just, if you just had this. In fact, think about the Garden of Eden right? God gives them everything except one tree. It's, God's like, here, Adam, Eve, 99.9% of everything is yours. Just don't eat from this tree. And then the serpent shows up like the serpent he is. And what does he do? He tempts them with the one thing that they don't have. And if, if you just went here. If you just ate, I know all these other trees, like, yeah, it's yummy, it's good, but you're missing out on that one thing. And if you just went to that one tree, then you'd be happy, then you'd be fulfilled, then you would be like God. (laughs) We all know how that went. 
Here we are, right? Like how many years after Adam and Eve, this is still playing itself out today all the time. The lies and the deception of the enemy come for all of us. They just come in unique ways. Can I share how they've come for me? Let me, let me just bare my soul. I like golf. Anybody with me? Come on, where are my golfers at? All 10 of you. Okay. That's good. There wasn't many more in the nine o'clock service. I just, I'm your pastor, okay? Do as I do. Golf, okay? It's great. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, when we grew up, like, I, I didn't have a lot of money, which meant that the only golf that I could afford to play was Little River Golf Course in Forest Glade. Anybody ever played Little River before? Yeah, it's awful, okay? I don't feel bad saying that. It's a city-run course, and, like, you get what you pay for. The reason why I learned how to golf there, because it was, like, 10 bucks for nine holes in, like, a cart. And I think it came with, like, five hot dogs. You know, they were just, like, giving stuff. It was like, but you get what you pay for. Like, seriously, I, like, you could hit the ball right in the middle of the fairway, and it felt like you're still in the rough. Like, just, like, it wasn't well manicured. Uh, but this is, this is how I learned to golf and where I learned to golf. I remember the first time I was invited to Essex Golf and Country Club. Yeah. Whew. In case you don't know, Essex Golf and Country Club is nothing like Little River, okay? We walked through the, uh, the, the, the dressing rooms. They just smelt like rich mahogany and leather-bound books, you know? Like, it just, it was amazing. They have this, like, bar, restaurant area, and there's this bartender who just knew everybody's name. You know, it's like an episode of Cheers, like in real life. Like it was, it was, the food was amazing. Like amazing food. It's not, it's not the Little River hot dog. I, I learned this. And, and then we played on the course and every blade of grass was like meticulously cut and cared for. And I remember being at Essex Golf and Country Club, and then I had the thought, what do I have to do to get here? Like, like, what do I have to do to never play Little River Golf Course again in my life? I'll leave the ministry, I'll stop preaching sermons, I'll go to med school, become a doctor, if that's what it takes, but I need to be here. Anybody ever had a moment like that? <laughs> Another time, not long ago, um, we were going out for dinner with some friends and instead of meeting at the restaurant, uh, they thought they'd come pick us up first and we'd go together. I thought, oh, that's nice. And so they rolled up to my house in a brand new Cadillac Escalade. Whew. I gotta tell you, I'm not a big car guy. Like I've just never had that itch. And then I got in a Cadillac Escalade, <laughs> you know, like I, I drive a 2014 Ford Taurus, okay? I paid cash for, it's very Dave Ramsey of me, okay? And then I got in the Escalade and I had this moment exactly like I did at the golf club. I had this moment of thinking, what do I have to do to get one? I will sell my kidney if it gets me one of these cars. Like, you know, like, <laughs> we laugh. You've all been there. You've all been there. There's these moments, right? Now, okay, let me be very clear before I move on. There is nothing wrong with nice golf clubs or cars. Nothing. If you can afford to pay for those things and still have room in your bank account to be generous with other people, God bless you. But if you can't afford those things, and if now you find yourself in a position where you're rethinking the will of God for your life so that you can acquire those things, I'm telling you, you're on the wrong side of this. What you're doing is you're investing into the bank of the world. You're hearing the lies and the temptations of the enemy that come for us all the time. It says, even though you've tried all these things and they've never filled you before, you're just missing that one tree. Even though everything else, every time you thought that it's going to fill you and it didn't, 
Well, what you were really missing was just this one last investment. And if you just invest into the things of the world one more time, it's going to fill you. It's a lie. You know, there's Rockefeller, who, one of the most wealthy men to ever live. He was asked the question, how much money is enough? And he answered by saying, just a little bit more. The reality is the more that you get, the more that you want. It's a bottomless pit. You see, what Jesus is doing here this morning in this message is, I I honestly just feel that he's calling us out. (laughs) I think he's trying to save us from ourselves. I think he's trying to save us from the lies of the world, the lies of the enemy that speak to us all the time. And he's saying, would you just be about my business? <laughs> would you just be about my plans on the earth? Would you, just, would, would, would you just be a generous person with your life? I just feel like he's, he's calling us out this morning. Can we stand on up to our feet all across this room? This morning, um, my, my, my prayer for us as a church is not that you would tithe more, although maybe that's the message God's given you. My, 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 my prayer for your life is that you would learn to be a generous person. My, my prayer for your life is that you would learn uh, to live out radical generosity. I'm talking like dangerous generosity. Uh, I'm praying that God, if you have scales over your eyes, like this rich man with the barn, if that's you, and if you think you are where you are because you're awesome, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would just blow that up in your mind, okay? You're not. It's not yours. Everything you have is from God. What do you have that you did not first receive? Everything God has given you, he's given it to you so that you can be a blessing to other people. You are where you are when you are for his glory, not for yours. You hear me? And I'm just praying over us as a church this morning that God would remove the blinders. That, that it, maybe you're in the room today and it's like, you need to repent. You, repent just means you're gonna turn around and walk towards Jesus. You've been living the world way. It hasn't been working. And Jesus is just saying, okay, are you done? Are you finally done? And would you just come over? Would you just be about my kingdom? For some of you, honestly, it's, it's repentance is what you need. You need to learn to trust in Jesus that he's gonna be your provider. We we, we need to walk with him day by day, trusting in his voice. We need to be generous. Just in case you're thinking, man, Danny, are the finances of the church that bad? No, (laughs) they're good. (laughs) This isn't about, we need more money. This is about your spiritual health. And for far too many in the church, we get to this topic and we hit a wall. Everything you have is from him, everything. And it's been given to you so that you can be a blessing to others. And when you do this, when we sow into the kingdom of God, here in the message translation, you're giving to the bank in heaven where no one can rob that. No one can take that from you. I don't know about you, but if it's true that Jesus is going to return, we don't know when. It could be today, it could be next week, it could be in a year. We don't know when. If it's true that Jesus is going to return, and if it's also true that every investment I make right now into his kingdom is going to last for eternity, then I want to invest into the right bank. I want want to invest into the kingdom of God. I want to leverage this life for the next. Are you with me? Right? Like what we do now matters for eternity. It does. And so church, 
Be generous. Live with urgency. This hits every aspect of our life. Live generously. This is the word of Jesus himself. This is how we become a house of generosity as we move forward.